leave the room, I will remember who you are. <laughs> All right, well, I'm here to talk about what we're doing with kernel documentation. I've been the, the documentation maintainer for just about two years now all things. Um, I was amused yesterday when Daniel was talking about the difficulties in getting people to sign up to as maintainers because um, people tried to get me to do it for a while and I finally gave in. So I dug up this old quote from Neil Brown. And, um, sorry, that maintainers are good because they're good at doing something else and not good enough at hiding from being a maintainer. Uh, so Daniel's reluctant maintainers are clearly good because they're good at refusing to be maintainers and that's, that's what you need. Anyway, Documentation. Where are we at with regard to documentation? And we'll get to where we're going. Well, Linux kernel, we've seen these numbers already a few times. I won't go over them again. Let's just say that the kernel is big. It's developed very quickly. There's, there's a lot happening there. Um, it's a, a large and fast-moving project. So we would want to have a, a base of documentation to match that because we have a very complex system there. And people need to, to read about it in a lot of different ways. So what do we actually have? We have a directory called documentation. It's the only top-level kernel directory that starts with a capital letter, so you know that we think documentation is important. Um, there's, there's about 2,200 files in there, stored in over 200 directories, makes up something 20-some megabytes of material, so there's a fair amount of stuff in that, tr that directory tree. That's excluding, by the way, the device tree stuff, which is stored under documentation, but it doesn't really belong there at this point, and um, at some point they say we'll be moved out of the kernel tree altogether, although I've not seen any real movement on that in quite some time. There's also some stuff scattered elsewhere in the tree, some stuff in scripts and so on, but it's, it's mostly centered in the documentation directory itself. It is organized in two basic chunks. The, the bulk of it is in the form of 2,000 some ordinary text files. These, these very all over the map in terms of what they are. There's, there's stuff for kernel developers. There's a whole bunch of material there for kernel users, all kind of mixed together. Some of the stuff in there is, is current and comprehensive and very useful. If you go through and you read memorybarriers.txt and you make it through to the end and you do the quick quizzes, you will be smarter than me, certainly, and probably most other people as well. Some of the other stuff there is um, not quite so useful, shall we say. So it runs all over the map. There is also a directory called docbook, which contains a bunch of formatted documentation in the form of 34 template files. These can be rendered using information from the source code itself into nice formats like PDF, HTML, and so on. The docbook material is pretty much all aimed at kernel developers at this point. It's mostly API documentation, internal API documentation, with, with, with some exceptions. But um, that is the, the core of the docbook stuff. So that's what we have under the documentation directory itself. But there's actually a little bit more than that in the source code itself. If you look, you'll find a whole bunch of comments in the kernel doc format. These comments, they all start with the slash double star marker saying this is a kernel doc comment. They have a line describing what's being documented here. In this case, the list add function or macros, the case may be. Some number of lines describing the arguments to the functions and then a free-form description of, of what the function does. So I, of course, chose a, a very short one here that would fit on the slide. Many of them are quite a bit longer than this. Um, these comments can also describe things like structures. You can describe your data structures and what the various fields mean and so on. There's documentation that's not attached to any particular function or structure, but it's larger scale theory of operation or whatever sorts of documents. There's a lot of stuff in there. In fact, if you do a quick grep, you'll find there are about 55,000 of these kernel doc comments throughout the kernel. So we have a lot of documentation contained within the source code itself. So there's a lot of stuff there. Um, somebody mentioned intelligent design before. Um, I have an intelligent design slide too because we really don't have any. <laughs> um, there's, there's no overall vision for the kernel documentation. If you look in the directory, you'll find that things have been just sort of thrown wherever and they're put there and they tend to be forgotten for years. Uh, a former documentation maintainer, Rob Landley, described it this way. It's a gigantic mess, currently organized based on where random passers-by put things down last. Um, he said that back in 2007. It hasn't really changed a whole lot since then. 
You can get a real sense for it just by doing an LS of the top level documentation directory. Right? Anytime you have a directory listing that looks like that, you know you've got trouble. Because there's, you know, how are you going to find something in this? Your documentation should be discoverable, it should be organized, you should be able to get something out of it. And you go and you find hundreds of files here, all jumbled in together. Um, you know you've got a mess. So you've got things like memory barriers.txt I described before, submitting patches, the, the core file on how to interface with the kernel's patch submission process, or you have things like Zorro.txt describing an old bus that sat on Amiga systems and is probably not useful to most readers at this point and really everything in between. It's all in there. I was trying to just come up with a good analogy for describing what this directory looks like and the best thing that I could come up with was my daughter's bedroom. <laughs> um, you know, everything is just kind of thrown in there and um, you can't really find anything. In fact, you just don't even want to go in there if you can. You know, I used it in one other talk once where she was in the audience and well, <laughs> she was sending me texts during the talk. <laughs> Let's just put it that way. So anyway, the other problem with, with the kernel documentation is there's no integration to it. There's no, there's no linkage between the documents, no sort of cross-references, no way to move from one document to the next, not even in the formatted documentation. It's, every document is its own little world, its own little silo without a whole lot of, um, of, of linkage between them. This is, like I said, is true even of the kernel doc of the formatted documentation, which does have some advantages, right? Because much of the documentation that's in the source code itself, this is deemed to be a good thing, one, because it's where you're likely to want it when you're actually looking at the source code. The other thought here is that when developers are changing the source, they will, of course, also go in and change the documentation to match the changes they made in the source. Um, I find this to be a fairly optimistic view of the kernel development process, but it does sometimes happen that way. So it's a good, it's a good thing to have the documentation and the source together whenever you can. It does enable the, the development of, of documents that are a little bit better integrated, but only to a point. Each, each doc book template file is still its own world and cannot link into the other ones. There's, there's no, no mixture between them. You can create various sorts of output formats. So if you want PDF output or you want uh, web pages to put up, that sort of thing, you can get it. And there's an active interest in, in parts of the community to improve this sort of stuff. There's actually some fairly extensive documentation in, in the doc book directory, especially in current kernels. Um, as you'll see, we're, we're starting to move it out of there. But that's what we have now. So there's some good things, but whenever somebody leads up to something like that, you can tell that there's, there's a downside coming. And the best way that I came up with to describe this is that if you were to go to a bunch of low-level C writing kernel programmers and say, make us a nice formatted documentation system that will create indexes and do all that sort of stuff, you know, what do you think you're going to get? <laughs> um, yeah, we got it. Um, <laughs> we got exactly what you would get. It's really kind of messy. So I'm going to step very quickly through how this works, just because it's kind of amusing. So if you go on and you type make HTML docs, which is the command to create the, the documentation in, in HTML format, what it's going to do is it's going to go to these template files, which look like this. The first line here in this example is just a basic doc book title line, right? Nothing special there. Um, it sort of it describes what the template files look like, though. You tend to wear out your angle bracket keys if you're typing these things. The, the following lines, the ones with the exclamation points, are instead a special addition that, that we have added to DocBook. They have the, the nice advantage of not actually being standard DocBook. So as soon as you put those into your DocBook files, they don't validate as XML DocBook anymore. So um, you can't use DocBook editors on them and things like that. It's just, just an extra feature we thought we would throw in there. So the first line, for example, says go to lib slash vsprintf.c and get all of the exported functions out of there. Get the documentation for all the functions that have been exported out of that file. That's what the E means. The two middle lines are getting documentation for specific functions. There's a few other escape patterns as well that you can use to, to extract documentation from the source code files. So what happens is there's a little program written in C called docproc. 
that will go through and read this, this template file and find all of these, these lines. Then it will go and read the source code file. So we've got a little C program that's reading the other C programs, parsing them, and finding all the export symbol lines to get a list of the exported symbols in the particular source file. It then pulls up this thing called kernel doc, which is sort of a nightmare of 15, 20 year old Perl. It's basically the, the regular expression collection from hell that will go through and parse the source code and find all of the actual function definitions that are in the source code file. Okay, this is done as a separate step because the exports and the function definitions are not always in the same place. They should be, but they aren't for various historical reasons. So kernel doc will do that and produce a list of all of the functions, data structures, whatever, that are actually defined in that source code file. Kernel doc then is run again to read the source code file again to extract the documentation that is actually wanted from that file. So we've now parsed the source code file three times to, um, to actually get the, get the documentation out of those kernel doc comments. Kernel doc will format them up as very simple doc book and emit them out, at which point doc proc will stuff them into the template file, make a new file that has now just doc book in it. That sort of thing. But we're not done because somebody a year or so ago decided we'd be nice to actually have cross references, which we never had. So it's another little Perl program that will read this file, find the various function definition documentation, create cross references wherever they're referenced and stuff those into there, making a new munged up doc book file and put that out. So now we have cross references, but only within a single template file, not across them. And then the whole thing is fed to XML2, which is this whole nasty doc book tool chain that will turn it into what you want to have. So at the end of all of this, you actually get your new documentation out the other end. So there are some problems with this, starting with the fact that it's really slow. It can often take longer to build the documentation than it takes to build the kernel. And this, this just is, it seems wrong, right? Fundamentally wrong. It's, it's brittle. It's easy to break the, the, the documentation build process by making source code changes in, in the files themselves, right? Without actually touching the documentation, you can break the doc build process. Kernel developers are not always very diligent about testing the documentation build after they've changed the code. Um, so it breaks and then I get the email um, as if I had done this. It's hard to make, make the whole thing work at a kernel summit. I asked the, the crowd once, how many of you have actually succeeded in, in setting up the, the documentation build tool chain? And I got less than half the room raising their hands. Um, you know, kernel developers are not experts in this particular domain, but they're not stupid. And, um, and many of them had tried and failed to make this stuff work. We have these, these kernel doc comments, but you can't actually use docbook or any other kind of formatting within them. It's just freeform text. So you can't really do much that you might want to do with that. And there's no integration with the rest of our documentation directory. It, again, it's all standalone. So this was the status as of a year or so ago. And a bunch of us asking, how can we make this better? Because this is not really where we would like to be. So you know, what would our goals be? What would our requirements be? We'd like to clean up the mess that is the documentation directory. This has been on the, the list of things to do for a long time. Rob Landley actually tried to reorganize the, the documentation tree. He came up one day and posted a patch that moved everything all in one big patch and reorganized the whole thing. And um, Rob does not have a light hand in dealing with things, if you know him. So he didn't get very far. Um, so we're going to try, we're trying it a little bit more um, gently this time around. Try to produce better formatted um, output with a more rational tool chain than what we have before. And a key requirement here is that we need to have plain text files still at the end. If we're not going to say, tell everybody, okay, now all the documentation is done in LibreOffice. LibreOffice is a nice tool. It's just totally unsuited to this particular job, right? People want to be able to grep things out of the documentation. They want to be able to edit them with text editors and track them in Git and so on and so forth. So we need to have plain text files for our documentation. There's really no alternative to that. So the work in this direction started, I don't know, a year and a half or so ago when Daniel and others started looking at initially adding markdown processing to the kernel doc comments. Because Daniel's group is trying to move a lot of the GPU graphics documentation into the source 
and document it meant it much better to make it easier for driver developers to get their job done. And he wanted to be able to do basic formatting and such within the comments and said, okay, we'll add, add a feature so that these comments can now be in the markdown format. Markdown being a very simple plain text format. So we talked about this for a while, patches went around. Uh, it was set at some point to switch to ASCII doc, which seemed like a better way to do this. Um, and it brought some nice features, right? Uh, so put move more documentation into the source. And the documentation that was in the source didn't have to be documented in DocBook itself, which again is kind of painful to, to use. And this would hopefully lead to better documentation. But once again, there were some downsides to all of this in these patches that went around. Um, this included the fact that we've now added a new tool to that whole house of cards that I described before. Now we add something like ASCII doc to it as well. So this made the whole thing that much bigger and slower and more brittle. Um, we ended up having real disagreements between the tools and it turned out there's certain things you just could not do because the ASCII doc and XML2 and all that could not agree on the, the escaping of entities and so on. There were things that you just could not get through the tool chain intact at all. Um, we made a slow build process and made it slower to the point where it could actually literally take hours to build their docs, um, which was not going to help my cause of getting kernel developers to test the documentation build. Um, still no linkage between documents. We didn't really solve that problem at all. And we added a, a dependency on a Ruby-based tool chain to, to the whole thing that we had already. Kernel developers, I mean, there are some developers who've been fighting for years to get Perl out of the build process. Um, you know, adding Ruby, I, I, I did not want to be the one who went in front of the crowd and said we needed this. Let's just put it that way. So, so there were a bunch of disadvantages to that. And I had really hoped for a different approach to this in the first place, which was rather than add something to process the kernel doc comments themselves, let's just get rid of docbook entirely and do the whole thing in whatever it is we want to add. Rather than just adding ASCII doc or whatever there, do the whole thing in ASCII doc. Instead, get rid of a big tool chain dependency and simplify the whole thing. So uh, we could use any of these processors that were out there. Hopefully even bring in the, the unformatted documents, which are already pretty close to being in the format that these, these markup languages use, and then try to create a nice integrated documentation tree. So this was my, my vision of this. You know, I thought this was really the way to go. But it wasn't what we had, and we had a bunch of patches out there, and I firmly believe that the working solutions should not be delayed just because the maintainer thinks, oh, it sure would be nice if we did it this other way instead. So I was actually set to merge that work, even though I didn't really like all of that, but I decided before I did it I would look around just a little bit more. So I did that. And I looked at something I'd had an eye on for a while, which is a system called Sphinx. Sphinx is the documentation system that is used by the Python language and pretty much every library and every program written in Python and so on. Um, it's, you can find it there at sphinxdoc.org. Or it's based on restructured text, which is yet another simple markup language. Of course, not the same as the other ones, but the same basic idea. It just looks like plain text. The, the markup is minimized as much as possible. And you can read the files as text files. It had a lot of advantages, right? It's designed for documenting code. So Sphinx understands concepts like this is a function. We're documenting a function here. Or this is a structure, things like that. It, it's not something that we had to teach to it. It is, it's already built into there. It's designed for dealing with large documents split out into multiple source files, something that neither Markdown nor ASCII doc does very well at all. And since our documentation is in fact quite large, this is something we really wanted to have. Um, it's widely used and it's well supported and nicely, it is supported by somebody else. We like that as opposed to um, having to create and support our own tool chain and can output to a whole bunch of formats. Um, this slide is a little bit wrong here and that the PDF output using the RSF, RST to PDF tool turns out not to work very well. Um, so we end up having to use LaTeX for that part of, of the tool chain, which adds a massive dependency back into it. This is something I would sure like to see fixed at some point. Um, we had to backtrack a bit on that. So I'm not entirely pleased with that, but we can do it. We get very nice HTML output from it and we can get things like EPUB, which we couldn't get before. So I liked this, this whole idea. 
So I, I hacked up a really ugly proof of concept and I put it out there. Um, Andrew Morton once said that it can be very hard to get kernel developers to work on a problem, but there's one surefire way to do it, which is to post a really bad solution. And then somebody will have to come in and show you how to do it right. Um, and it works every time, and it works this time. I put that out there, and um, Yanni Nikula came out and took that proof of concept and turned it into something that, that we could put out there without being ashamed of it. And ran with it. So he put that out there, and we talked about it. And it didn't take long to build a consensus around this approach of going to Sphinx instead. So this is what we have. So the way it works is that, first of all, the kernel doc comments work the way they always did. One of the key requirements of all this is that anything that required us to change the format of 55,000 kernel doc comments was not going to go anywhere. Because again, I didn't want to be the one trying to get that patch set merged. Um, we actually had a developer in this who wanted to put in a, a format change there, and we had to, to fight that back because it just wasn't going to work. So they work the way they are now, unchanged. But if you want to put restructured text directives into them, you can now do so. And people are starting to do that. So it all pretty much works. It gives us nice things like cross-references between documents now. We get things like function indices for free. It just sort of generates them because it knows what functions are. Much nicer output and a documentation build that is nice and fast and easy. And so we get a documentation build now that looks like this. This is with nobody having really put any effort into tweaking the, the, the output formats at all. And in fact, I think we could make it a whole lot better. This is the basic read the docs theme that we're using here, the, the Sphinx support. So this was, we got this really with almost no effort at all. And so we get output that looks like this. The, the old HTML out, output that came from the docbook tool chain was, um, let's just say it wasn't this pretty, um, to say the least. So how does it work? You just create a restructured text file, perhaps convert it from an existing file there and throw it into the documentation directory pretty much anywhere that makes sense. It doesn't have to be in a specific directory anymore and add a reference to it to the top level index.rst file or perhaps a lower level file because we're starting to create sub documents at this point. And that's it. It's really quite easy to, to do this. And so we've started to do this. Converting the files is easy. This is, hopefully that's sort of legible, but the, the point that I want to make is that most of the documents that are in the kernel source tree, the unformatted documents, are already in restructured text or something very close to it. It just takes little tweaks to get the white space right, to tweak things. Um, there's, it takes almost no work. Typically converting a document is a job that takes maybe 10 minutes to do for anything of, of any normal sort of scale. So this is good for, for existing documents. If you want to bring in kernel doc comments, um, Yanni wrote a new extension module for, for Sphinx. It's, I think, on the order of a couple hundred lines of, of Python code. It's nothing all that significant. So that we now have directives in the Sphinx format to bring in the kernel doc comments from the code. So once we've added our directives, we still have valid Sphinx files. We haven't created some new weirdo format. And so you just put in something like that. You pick one of the, the alternatives you want, if you want all the exported functions or specific functions or, or a name, document section, whatever. So you just add a few of these and you get the kernel doc comments pulled into the Sphinx file, just as part of the Sphinx build done by Sphinx itself. So we've simplified this part of the tool chain quite a bit. We don't actually need the doc proc program anymore. We are still using kernel doc behind the scenes to do this, but um, maybe someday you can get rid of that or at least improve it as well, but it's still there for now. So all of this stuff was merged for 4.8. So as of Sunday, this will be in the, the official mainline kernel. So. We're just beginning with the, with the document conversions and so on. So we have a document on how to do the documentation itself. It's kind of the first thing we did. The, the GPU documentation has been converted over. That's a huge document that, that Daniel and company converted over. And the media subsystem documentation, which is an even huger document, because they do all of their user space documentation, all that stuff is actually in the kernel. So really massive document. Um, this was kind of interesting because Mauro, the, the, the media subsystem maintainer, was kind of brought into this late and unwillingly. He was like, hey, Mauro, do you mind if we like change the format of this massive body of documentation that you spent years building in there? And he kind of said, well, um, I don't know. 
But then he saw what we could do and he jumped on it and, and really went for it and became our most enthusiastic user of this in a, in a real sense. So he's converted many megabytes of documentation and uh, made some nice changes to the system as a whole and really run with this. And you'll see what the results of some of that were. Um, starting with this, this was Linus's message when he put out the 4.8 RCC1 uh, announcement saying that the patch is a little bit unusual because it's 20% documentation, which is very much unusual for a kernel <laughs> patch, shall we say. And this was the result of the conversion of the GPU and the media documents in particular. All that. Um, so, I mean, it was a big enough thing to make a splash in the, in the release cycle as a whole. And, you know, release cycle is not a small thing. Um, some of the developers who have been working in this seem to be fairly happy with it. Mauro, after doing all this and complaining about a few things, because Sphinx is not without his warts, and he has found them, um, still says that it is now much easier to maintain the media documentation and make it more consistent than it was with DocBook. He is happy with what we got. Um, the other one, Jesper Dongard Brower is a, is a networking developer, and he, he put out a document, this was just a week or so ago, saying this new format makes it really easy to combine all this stuff with pretty documentation, pretty browser documentation, plain text for, format files, all being changed by you get, you gotta love it, it's the way he put it. So developers seem to be happy with this so far, which is a good thing. So that's pretty much where we stand as of 4.8. But we are um, not yet done. So some of the things that we'll see in 4.9 include a new manual called the Driver API Manual. I started by taking one of our docbook template files. It was called devicedrivers.template. I converted it to Sphinx and split it into several different files and just sort of put it out there as, okay, now this is our driver, our, our driver API file now. And it prints out, if you were to print it, it would probably print it a couple hundred pages by the time it has actually pulled in all the kernel doc comments from the source code itself. Um, that sort of thing. So converted a bunch of stuff under uh, into restructured text. And then mostly as an example of what, what we want to do here, one of the subsystems documented in this template file was the high-speed serial interface, or HSI subsystem. And it was a very typical example of how kernel stuff is documented. So Somebody at some point wrote a file called hsi.txt and put it into the main documentation directory as an overall description of how the HSI subsystem works. Somebody else at some point realized, hey, look, we can get all of the kernel doc comments from the HSI subsystem. So they put that into the device drivers.template file. So we had that stuff in one file over here, the basic theory of operation documentation over here, and no connection whatsoever between the two, not even say, hey, you can find that other stuff over there if you look for it. So I took the hsi.txt file, converted it to restructured text, and added it to the stuff from device drivers.template so that we now have a single file describing the entire HSI subsystem. The whole job took me about 10 or 15 minutes to do all that sort of stuff. I put that out there and got a nice thank you from the HSI subsystem maintainer for having done it. Um, there's a ton of this stuff to do. This is really <laughs> just the beginning of this sort of thing. So um, as I said before, if you were looking for something to do, if you were looking for a way to contribute to the kernel, cleaning up the documentation in this sort of way is, is a job that's going to take, I, mean, I honestly think it'll take years, even though it's not that hard to do. But there's a lot of files there and it's really messy and we would like to make it less messy and then perhaps even improve the documentation while we're at it. But just starting by making it less messy, more accessible and more discoverable will be a real step in the right direction. So beyond the driver API stuff, I also made another book called the De Development Tools book. And so I found Again, spread out through this directory were a whole bunch of files describing various development tools. There's the Coxnell document, for example. There's a thing on KSON, one on UBSON, one on debugging with GDP. All that stuff was, again, spread out with no kind of set attempt to pull it all together. So I did that. We now have a development tools manual. This, I mean, it was several documents. It maybe took me a couple hours to do this, but it wasn't that hard. And so we have some organization there again. Again, I'm trying to sort of lead by example and, and show the sorts of things that I would like to have, have done here in the hopes that others will do.
Um, we will also in 4.9 have, have PDF output. Again, it's not as nice as we would like because you have to um, install the whole um, Zelatex, I think, package, all that sort of stuff. I did the, the zipper install package on, a, on an OpenSUSE tumbleweed system. It says preparing to install 1,700 packages. Um, tech is like that. It's, it's kind of painful. But once you get it there, it, it works, and you can get very nice PDF output. Again, nicer output than we got before with, with the whole XML2 package. So that, that's all stuff that's queued up for 4.9. Um, I'm ready to, to send it in as soon as the merge window opens, and we'll have quite a bit of stuff going in. Through the documentation tree, I assume there will be stuff through the GPU tree and other things as well, adding um, more good things there as well. But that's, that's the, the stuff that I will be adding in 4.9. 4.10, I mean, it's hard to say what's going to happen for sure. The one thing is that, that I know will happen, just because I, I, I resisted it a bit and pushed it back for a reason I'll get to in a moment, is that we're going to have a development process manual added. There's a lot of files under documentation that describe not the code really, but how to work with the kernel development community. Now, quite a bit of stuff there, starting with the basic how-to file, um, things like submitting patches, again, this, this whole checklist on what you have to do to submit a, a patch to the, to the kernel community, um, Greg's stable kernel rules, the text file, the coding style document, which is a whole fun thing in its own right. Whenever somebody sends me a coding style patch, I really start to cringe because, in a sense, it makes me the arbiter of, of kernel coding style, and I do not want to be there. Um, that's, you just don't want to be between people when they're starting to argue about that sort of thing. So I tend to resist those. Um, then this is famous man management style document and a whole bunch of other stuff. Mauro went in and converted something like 20 of these, more than 20 of them, to, to the RST thing and sent this patch moving them all to this process directory and making a, um, making a nice document out of them. And I thought this is great. This is actually just the kind of thing that I want to do. But um, if you think about this for a sec, there's, there's a problem here. You know, Greg in his talk put up a, a pointer to one of these files. I forget which, which one you put up there. Um, maybe it was submitting patches. I don't know. But people always are sending people, go read documentation slash submitting patches. And so I'm really kind of worried that if I now move that to documentation slash process slash submitting patches to RST, that people are going to yell at me. Um, you know, there are, there's only a few of these, but there are documents that people really know where they are. You, you, you'll often see people being told, go read documentation slash coding style, because it's clear that you did not before you sent this patch. Um, that sort of thing. So there's a whole lot, if we move them, you're going to create a whole lot of dangling mental pointers in the, in the kernel community, and I'm worried about this. I'm, I'm not sure that people are going to like that. So I want to raise it here. I think I'll try to raise it at the kernel summit and see just how many objects people throw at me and how hard they are. And um, see how hard we have to work at it, maybe leaving sim links behind for some of these or something like that. But I do want to do this because... I don't think we can go on with, with a documentation directory with 300 files in it because you can't find anything. We've got to impose a reasonable hierarchy there. The rest of the kernel source tree does not look like that, right? We have, we have organized things in a way where we can find them. And I want to do the same with the documentation. So we'll see that happen. I'm mean, pushing that for 410 and we'll see how much screaming we have with that. So other stuff that's on the horizon, of course, is to convert the other docbook template files. There's still on the order of 30 of them there that need conversion. Um, some of them maybe need deletion, but, um, but those need to be examined on a case-by-case -case basis and all that sort of thing. And it is my hope at some point to convert them all and simply remove the docbook de dependency altogether so that we don't need docbook anymore. That would be a nice thing. Rethink the kernel doc utility, because again, that's 20 years of, of Perl Cruft. Um, that, that is a hard little program to go in and edit. Um, that sort of thing. We have a very enthusiastic developer out there who actually rewrote the whole thing in Python and submitted it and said, here, throw it out. Use my Python version instead. And I was there thinking, okay, you know, we're putting in a whole new documentation tool chain. Do I really want to replace a working utility with another one that's hopefully working? 
And I, I pushed back on that for, for now and didn't do that. But at some point, we may consider something like that in the future. Um, incorporate more of the plain text documents. We started doing that, but there's still nearly 2,000 of them to go. Um, again, a fair number of those should be deleted. I have a hard time deleting documents, I found. People don't want to do that, even for stuff that is really crufty and old and doesn't necessarily describe stuff. One of the process documents that Mauro converted tells you all about how to FTP down a patch and apply it to your 2.6 kernel. Um, you know, nobody FTPs patches in, um, you know, in gzip format and applies them to, to tarballs anymore, right? That sort of thing. But I get resistance in deleting that sort of thing. I, I think we need to do more of that. We don't keep kernel code around because we think it might be useful to somebody someday. If we're not using it, it's gone. Um, I think we need to do the same with the documentation as part of our effort to turn it into something useful and rational. So we'll need to do that as we incorporate more of these documents and bring um, more order to the documentation tree. And of course, in all of this, we want to create more and better and more up-to-date documentation as well. And that's kind of where I stop. That's what I have to say. I will be happy to throw the pillow at anybody who has a question to ask. I'll just express the opinion as someone who used to be a newbie and someone who interacts with many newbies. I think that having a hierarchical documentation would be much, much better than the current situation. And, you know, Greg can adjust when he gives his talk. He can put process in the right place. It's not that big deal. Um, people who know things can find them. And people who don't know things can orient themselves more easily. Well, thanks. Yeah, I, th I think people can adjust too. I'm, I'm partially leery because of Rob Landley's bad experience. But, but again, I'm taking a bit of a different approach than Rob does. Um, a bit less of a bull in the china shop, if I can say so. Um, so hopefully I'll get away with it. Uh, regarding the possibility to move files, there is something which could actually work, which is to uh, create the new files and replace the contents of the old files with uh, just a line, uh, update your links as this file has moved to this location. And you can keep that for, uh, <coughs> I don't know, uh, two years or something like this. People will get used to the new location and uh, nobody will use the old one anymore. Yeah, in fact, we, that, that is one option that has been discussed. It's just leaving behind a single line, look over there sort of thing. With There's a file called kernel nano, kernel doc nano how to dot text, which describes the old kernel doc system. And we did that with that, saying this stuff is absolutely, you actually want to look over there and do it that way now. All right, back that away. Uh, how can we join the airport? I mean, what is the starting point? Who should we contact to get synchronized on all this stuff? Sorry, I didn't quite catch that. How do we start with, I mean, what is the entry point if someone wants to help you? If, okay, the entry point if somebody wants to help. You know, it's best if you, if you understand a specific subsystem, but even without that, if you just go and you look in the documentation directory, you type ls, you'll see a lot of files that don't belong there because it's most of them. You, know, you can throw a dart at it. Um, so, you know, look at a documentation file. Convert it to restructured text. Think about where it might properly belong in the hierarchy. In many cases, we haven't figured this out yet. And that's just part of why I've been pushing back on some of this as well, just a little bit, is that I'd rather not move things around and then move them again, if possible. But there's no way we're going to get it all right the first time. So there's going to be some of that as we figure out what the hierarchy should actually look like. Um, so, you know, just think about where some of this stuff should go. So, for example, we don't have a user's manual at all. A lot of the documentation in the kernel tree is, here's the options you can supply to this driver to make your device actually work, type things. You know, this, that's not for developers, it's for users. So, we need a user's manual. So, collecting a lot of that stuff together and making a user's manual would be a wonderful thing. But in general, find a document that interests you and, and figure out how it could be better represented in, in a new organization. It would be a great thing to do. I think he's got one more there. Uh, just to maybe get clear, I'm interested in converting some part of the actual documentation into RST. 
but I want to be sure that no one is already doing it before to avoid having duplicated efforts. So how can I be sure that the part I'm interested in are not already taken or how to <coughs> share with others that want to play with? Um, trying to avoid doing something someone else has already been done. Um, is that the... I, I mean, chances are you won't collide with somebody else, first of all, if you're <laughs> doing that. But if, if you're concerned, if you're concerned... The, the maintainer's file has a pointer to the docs next tree. So you can see the current status of, of the documentation tree by looking at the, by you know, doing a git fetch of the docs next tree and seeing what has actually been done and what has not. You know, the, the time required to do the conversion is so small that is, you're not likely to, to race with somebody else in, in getting at a file. If you look in docs next and it hasn't been converted there, then, it, then likely nobody is working on it. Okay, thank you. So I know the kernel developers have developed extreme skills in ASCII art, but have you considered an option to allow adding diagrams or, or other pictures or figures in the, in the documentation or not yet? Well, Sphinx can do pretty well at loading, say, SVG diagrams if you want to do that. There is interest in, in doing ASCII art. Right now, we just put it in as, as a literal block of text as if it were code, essentially. Um, so, you know, it comes in monospace and it works. But um, but it would be nice to do something better that way. There, there are also you know options for using fig or various other sorts of documentation things, graph viz, if you want to do that kind of thing. Um, so Sphinx handles a lot of those things, and for something like ASCII art, we're we're looking to improve it. Okay, did you? Yeah, Constantine. Um, when you're moving stuff around, I think if you leave a one-liner in the old location, but also and parsable. Because this way we can run a post-processing, say, if somebody over the internet, kernel.org slash documentation accessing the old location, we can build an HD access file based on what is the contents of, the, of those files that have been moved. So if, if you need a decision, I would suggest that you do this so that you leave these stubs of the old files and where they are and telling people where to look at so that people can, also, people can read and understand what it means. Mm -hmm. But it's also in a standard format that, that can, uh, we can parse and create a mapping of old to new that will be automatic. All right. that, that, that's a good thought, yeah. Um, you know, I don't think we will have very many of these. I do not want to leave lots of, of little pointers around. You know, I think most files people will simply find. You know, it's just a handful of ones that, that people know where they are. But also chances are people are not going to be going into the Git tree and looking at documentation, I'll probably go on the website and look at that. Mm -hmm. So this will help avoid this. Oh, I can't even click on this to go to the new place. Especially if our kernel.org website actually had the new format of documentation. That would really work nicely, wouldn't it? No comment. <laughs> hey, anybody? Yeah. Okay, long throw. Uh, uh, so uh, in Debian, we've been uh, packaging the .book generated HTML for years, and I've recently uh, so I've updated that to 4.8 to include the Sphinx generated HTML, and it is indeed beautiful. Um, something you didn't mention actually was that the 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 Sphinx HTML has offline search uh, implemented in JavaScript, which is uh, a great improvement. Um, there's only one problem, which is we now have two separate HTML hierarchies, each created an index of HTML, and they're not, uh, they're not combined in any way. Hopefully that, that will be sorted out. Yes, we do have two different HTML hierarchies. Hopefully the docbook one will eventually go away. That, that is the objective, which we, point, we will have one hierarchy with a whole lot more stuff in it than we ever had before. But yeah, it's, it's going to be a while, I think, before we get there. And yeah, I can see how that would be. And we could probably try to add some kind of cross pointers at least, so you can move from one to the other. That would be a good thing to do. Uh, two things. Have you considered doing symlinks when you move the file? Consider going to? Uh, symlinks, symbol. That, that, that is something that we've considered. I haven't actually looked at how well symlinks work in Git and that sort of thing. They probably have to be relative, right? Well, you, know, you would want them to be relative. Yes, they have to be relative. <laughs> um, either that or we tell everybody where they have to install their kernel tree. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, yeah, that's, that's a, that is an option we have considered. Yeah. And the other thing is, have you considered using some of the, uh, the text from LWN to 
put in a kernel, like because you have a lot of articles explaining kernel code. There, there are documents in the kernel tree now that had their origins, LWN okay. articles, yes. And, and I would be certainly happy to put more of them. It's just, you know, always been a matter of time to do that. All right, Hans, you have? Uh, so as a media maintainer, one of the maintainers, um, I would like, first of all, I would like to thank the Sphinx developers because they really helped us out big time. So they really did a lot of uh, fixing some of the wards of Sphinx to make it easier for us, especially when it came to table handling because the media documentation is full of tables and that was the, the most critical point for us to make sure that that worked. So kudos to Sphinx developers. Um, the other thing I wanted to mention, uh, as you say, there is a lot of deprecated, old, dubious documentation in there. Would it be an idea, in, it's too early now, but perhaps say in a year, to make an, an obsolete or deprecated directory and gen start moving them there? And if nobody comes up to fix them, or say these can be removed, then when that's, they're sitting there for a year, they just removed. Because that's that's, 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 having, having bogus documentation, is probably worse than simple wrong documentation. That, that had actually crossed my mind to have a museum manual or something like that uh, where the old stuff, kind of, like, kind of like the staging tree can be used to stage things out of the kernel, have a staging document to, to stage stuff out. Uh, put it over here and say, you know, this is ancient. If, if you really want it to stay around and make it current, um, otherwise it's, it's gone soon. Yeah, something like that would be good. As a consumer of documentation, um, I stopped long ago to use uh, LS to find documents. I, I admitted that there are no hierarchy uh, at all in the documentation. And I'm only using find and hope to, to switch something like that. So really, I encourage you, if you have good ideas for better hierarchy, do not hesitate to rework the whole thing. And you are not going to break any process uh, by doing that. Yeah, well, a lot of people use Finder or Grep, of course, is, is our documentation index. Get Grep. Um, so, so, yeah, people will find things. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, one concern as I have is, uh, is there any risk for a contributor to, uh, to break uh, the, uh, the doc generation by uh, not being uh, clearly aware of certain RST rules? Well, you can still break the documentation with source code changes, yeah. And certain kinds of changes, like if you change a struct to a union mm -hmm. and don't change the documentation to match, then the whole thing will still explode. Okay. That, that sort of thing, because we haven't changed that piece of the system at all. Okay. Um, but I mean, for the RST language itself, uh, is it just a matter of uh, appearing uh, not very nicely, or uh, will it break? Uh, because uh, I don't know, uh, I copy paste some code in the doc, and uh, some parts of the code are, are operators and confused by the language as an escape code or, or whatever. You see, yeah, yeah, the thing with these these plain text markup formats is almost anything is a valid input file. So you can end up with something that looks weird, and there are times when we'll tell you this is a strange indent level. Why did you do that? Um, that sort of thing, but it's it's pretty hard to really break things that way. You, you can add lots of warnings, okay. but um, but yeah, it's, it's pretty hard to break it. Somebody will surely find a way, but um, but it's it's pretty hard. All right, looks like we have one. Yeah, maybe just a quick comment. Uh, yeah, that. Uh, <laughs> Uh, about breaking stuff, one, one thing that's definitely much better with the new system is if you break something, uh, the old system just gave you a line in that massively five times munched uh, uh, doc book, which had absolutely no relation with the source code or your original template. And the new one tries to forward uh, a line number which is pretty close to where the real problem is. That there's some troubles in Sphinx that it doesn't give us correct line numbers sometimes. So you can still break it, but it should be a lot easier to fix the breakage. 
All right, well, I think it must be break time. Um, speaking of breakage, so thank you all very much.